Thank you. Um, my name is Miriam Pierce. My question around the education system that we have, and uh, when you use the word discussion these days in a university, the common response in Hong Kong might be to put the head down and start typing or writing something and not turning to the person next to you. So in that whole thing of getting the community talking about what it is, how can we get them off, or you might say using the technology to get the discussion going so they get back to this whole education, rather than first reaction is to go inside, you might say, to write an answer, but not inside, like you say, to find that seed within coming out. So the question is, what's the techniques that you might be saying to use in the current educated mass that's coming out of universities to get them discussing? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the education is all about participation. So uh, <clears throat> even more than discussion, I would like the word dialogue. Or dialogue doesn't necessarily mean just uh, between two. But even when you have a group together, you can have more dialogue. And uh, so I suggest that discussion should take place, first of all, in not too large groups, but maybe 15, 20 people at the maximum. And if possible, sit in a circle so that everybody is able to uh, uh, see each other and talk to each other, rather than speaking to the person uh, just in front of you and not beside you or behind you. So if you sit in a circle, that would be a good technique. And then have uh, on the board written, this dialogue is all about participation. So uh, everybody in the group need to be invited and given opportunity to, to speak. So that is a participation. And uh, so out of that circle, participation and dialogue, I think your discussion might emerge uh, and, and you might find some ideas which are a kind of more collective wisdom, as one would call it. You, collective wisdom might emerge. Bobsey has a question. A pleasure hearing you talk, such wisdom. Um, my question if, is around um, 2011, where we are almost on the cusp of 2012. You mentioned some great teachers, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, Gregory Bateson. Uh, this is perhaps the perennial wisdom that's been with us for ages and ages. Um, my question is, what signs do you, Dr. Satish Kumar, see in the world today, signs of hope in our education system, of this change, of this revolution that you speak so eloquently about? Yeah. Um, yes, there are signs of hope. Uh, when, um, even 10 years ago, I was going around uh, universities, uh, there were very few people who would be interested to talk about holistic education. Even the word holistic was very, un, very little known, or if it was, they didn't much care. So uh, in the last 10 years, the uh, awareness about these holistic ideas of everything interrelated are gaining ground. So there is a beginning there. And in most universities now, people are beginning to address these questions of sustainability, of uh, creativity, of imagination, all these ideas are starting to take place. But still, the business idea is very dominant. And even in big, big universities, the business schools get the most uh, finance and most support. And uh, so we need to put business, business has a place, of course. We need business, but business is not everything. It has a place, but there are other aspects as well. So um, my hope is, in young people, uh, and they are coming out of universities and gaining their own, even if universities did not teach them, they are creating their own ideas. And, uh, and there are, in England, I know, there are a number of movements like human skill education, and then 
the, the traditional movement, uh, quite long time, somebody was talking to me about Bacaloria, and that's a wonderful movement. And uh, they truly bring in the head, heart, and hands, and particularly very skill-based. So there are some international schools starting, um, Atlantic College in Wales, which has branches in a number of places. They use Bacaloria as their, uh, one of their system. So those movements are the hopes uh, of, for the future. And if they gain ground and we become more related uh, and be more connected with natural world, with our sustainability, I would like to see every school having a garden so that children can connect with natural world. In the garden, you see the plant growing. You sow the seed and you see how, what it happens to it. I would like to see in every school a kitchen where children can learn how to cook. And I'll talk about it tomorrow more, about food. So these are some basic things starting to happen in certain uh, areas, in certain schools. So let's all together promote those ideas. And then even intellectual education and, and scientific education has also important place. We must not throw baby with the bathwater. But it's a quite, quite question of balancing. And that is beginning to happen. I'm optimistic, yeah. <laughs> and after, in this audience, and such good response from you already, I'm, I'm optimistic. Great, thank you. The professor uh, here. Professor Wen yeah. has a question. Thank you, yes. uh, Dr. Satish. It's a fantastic speaking. But it's a most fantastic it's a speaking in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> you know that Kaduri Farm maybe is the only one farm in Hong Kong. <laughs> and Hong Kong has eliminated all of agriculture. And then when you talk about, I, 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 have, I have been familiar with your talk, so I know the meaning. But here in Hong Kong, when you talk about relationship, the human being and the nature beings, certainly we know that human being is a part of nature beings. Yes. But here in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong city is very poor. <laughs> they don't have any relationship with animals. Yeah. I mean, they eat pork, but they don't know the pork from, from pigs. Yeah. Because they cannot <laughs> see the pigs. Yeah. Okay. They eat uh, the, uh, a lot of meat, meat, but they don't know that where it's from. So they have no such kind of relation with the nature. Yeah, see, yeah, they have but some, some, some grass and the trees. But animal, animals, these are close to, the, to human beings. I think that they, they, they are... They, they are short of the, the, yes. the opportunities. Yes. How they deal with such kind of How, Yeah. I think uh, in Hong Kong, you are blessed with sea and water. So what my suggestion would be that there should be a renewal of uh, fishing. Compassionate, non-industrial, I mean, I'm a vegetarian, but not all Hong Kong people are vegetarians. So maybe fishing industry, and then getting not this industrial fishing. When you go in the ships, and the vast factory-like ships, and you have no connection. But when you are sitting by the water, and waiting for one fish to come, and then you are so happy that you got one fish, and you take it with love and care, and thank you with gratitude. And that is a kind of connection with the uh, other than human world, more than human world, connection with the natural world, with water, with, and sitting in peace, in quiet, in silence. We have forgotten, I would like to see all schools having silence in Hong Kong, if you can start schools and your classes with five minutes of silence, that would be a very good uh, reconnecting and think about the universe and the natural world. So, when you are sitting by the water and waiting and meditating in silence, that's a very spiritual and a very ecological, very environmentally sustainable way of living. And maybe Hong Kong is very poor from a natural point of view, but you are very rich from a financial point of view. So maybe you are so rich that now you can afford to have less work <laughs> in your offices, maybe three days a week. And then take one or two days, one or two days every week out 
even in new territory where Kaduri farm is, <laughs> you, can, you can go and walk and maybe garden or maybe do some walking. Some, so you can create your spiritual richness and your natural richness by being imaginative. That's all I can say. Thank you. Roy had a question. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, you speak of um, educating the heart. Yes. There's a, uh, a growing group of people in the technology field that believe that they can raise consciousness through games, biofeedback systems, and all kinds of things, uh, even tying in with social networks. Uh, so my question to you is, do you believe that the heart can be transferred and somehow through the digital world? Huh. <laughs> I don't think we need to transfer heart through digital world, because we have brain for that. So when we have good brain and we can use uh, technology or digital world or cyber space or anything, uh, scientific approaches with our brain. Because brain has been given to us for reasoning, for analysis, for uh, knowing uh, intellectually, and we should use that. But the heart's function, heart will not be so successful in going digital. You will, you will have a heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I would say use the heart for the purpose for which it is well equipped. And, and the, the function of the heart is to have courage. The word courage comes from the same root as heart. So have courage and have a trust and be free, free of fear. Those are the qualities which are related to heart. At the moment, our educational system is not training heart, and that is why our people are very fearful. There's a tremendous amount of fear. Fear of nature, fear of future, fear of not getting job, fear, fear, fear. Because our hearts are not trained to be courageous. Courage comes from heart. And so, trust and and uh, courage will give you energy to go out in the world, not knowing how the world is going to respond to you, and you will discover how wonderful the world is. As Andrew said, I walked around the world. I walked 8,000 miles without any money in my pocket. I could not have done it if I was just thinking digitally or <laughs> or uh, computer and Googling and all the kind of biological uh, kind of science and so on. I went with my heart, with courage. I said, I'm going to trust the world. And I went to Muslim countries, uh, Christian countries, capitalist countries, communist countries, black people, white people, every kind of rich, poor, every kind of people, without a penny in my pocket for two and a half years. You can read in my book, No Destination. And so that is the function of the heart, to have that fearless, courageous, adventurous spirit to love. Love is risky. You cannot love if you have fear. You have to have courage to love. But we don't have that courage, therefore we are afraid. And we don't want to love. We don't want, oh, I might get betrayed, or I, this might not last, or uh, the, the person might not understand me. Always fear, fear, fear. So use your heart for a wonderful purpose for which you have been given your heart. And use the, the technological uh, aspects with your brain. Thanks. Um, let's see. Where was Nathan? Because he had his hand. Ah, oh, you've moved. <laughs> OK, Nathan. <laughs> Yes, many of us are, in, uh, are not uh, classical educators, but we're in positions where we have leadership and we lead groups of people. And uh, so I'm wondering how we can best um, encourage, with, like the uh, apple tree metaphor, mm. encourage this growth and this development within the people that we are, we are leading or, or responsible for. Yeah, wonderful question. Um, <clears throat> 
first of all, we have to understand and appreciate that everyone is a potential leader. But some people have that developed quality, that quality is developed, and some people that quality is not yet developed, it's a bit undermined or suppressed or conditioned. So uh, for the leadership, you need three things. Number one, be an example. As Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. There is no integrity in telling other people what to do if you don't live it. There is no power in your words. The power in our words come with our example, with our practice, with our integrity. So that's the every leader needs to learn that, that before I ask anybody else to do anything, I have to live it. And when it comes from your whole being, your life, practice, then your leadership will be shining and, and it will be effective and people will follow you. The second thing is leader needs to learn to share and communicate. Lots of leaders don't quite convincingly able to communicate and share. So leaders need to learn this kind of technique to some extent. How to communicate your ideas in a way that listener, oh yes, I understand what you are trying to say. I understand. I, I know what you mean. Oh yes, yes, yes. That's a good communication. So learn to communicate and share. And the third is learn to organize. Because you can't, I mean, Nelson Mandela organized. Big anti-apartheid movement. Martin Luther King organized. Ma Mahatma Gandhi organized. Mother Teresa organized. All these things have been organized. So, so just words not enough. You have to learn the skills of organization. So through your practice and example and, and living, practicing what you are preaching, communicating well through writing, through words, through poetry, through music, through many, many ways. There's no one way of communicating. And leaders have to really learn to communicate. I mean, Vaclav Havel, he communicated through his plays and he became president of Czech Republic. So there are many, many people who have, through their inter, inter, intellectual, public intellectuals, who have led the world through communication and then organizing. So these three things, if you practice, then I think you can be a very successful leader. But eventually, we are all leaders. And the first thing to do is to lead our own lives in the right direction. If we don't lead our own life, how can we lead somebody else? That's the basic. Thanks. Um, OK, in the back. Thank you, Dr. Satish, um, for your loving speech. I might be my question a bit big. I'm just wondering your suggestion to uh, how we can treat our ch or teach our children, our students, or even ourselves to face the fear despite the uh, loss and despair in our life. Fear yeah. and Thank despair. You. And yeah. loss. Yeah. And loss, yeah. That's a very important Thank question, you. as you said. Big question. Um, Similar to the question of leadership, if parents and teachers themselves are fearless, then children will see how you deal with courage and without fear. So they will learn not by words, but by seeing. Children are very perceptive. I have two children, uh, one son and one daughter. And I know how perceptive they were, even when they were three, four, five, six years old. And so children watch parents, and children watch their teachers, and children watch their adults. So first thing you can teach children is by example. <coughs> Second thing is, do not stop your children from mistakes. Mistakes are good teachers. By mistake, they learn and be fearless. And so if children make mistake, that's welcome. They, by making mistake, if you always tell them, do this, do this, they never really develop their own imaginative skills. 
So do not stop children from mistakes or making mistakes. That's the second thing. And the loss, how you deal with loss and despair, this is something, there is no one word, there is no key. It's a very subtle art and it's a real communication and real relationship and then people see, children see how adults deal with despair because loss and despair is part of our existence. So do try not to condemn or denigrate or put down the aspect of loss and despair because gain and loss are complementary. If you have only gain, gain, gain and no loss, it will not be natural. Like birth and death are natural. There are two sides of the same coin. If there is no death, there is no birth, there is no reincarnation. So birth is beautiful, but death is also beautiful. So we must not fear death. So if children see that our parents, our teachers, our adults in the family, they don't fear death, then they will know how to deal with loss. Even if you have a sorrow, sorrow is natural. Only a living heart can feel sorrow. A dead heart cannot feel sorrow. So sorrow is part of life. Loss is part of life. Despair is, you have to despair and then empower. Uh, if you want to read about it, there's a wonderful author called Joanna Macy. And she has written uh, Despair and Empowerment. So we have to face the problems. We have to, nuclear weapons, uh, economic crisis, environmental destruction. All these things are very despairing. And, and we, we, we despair how what world is going to and, and, and how it is going through all this. So then you despair, but then you have to empower positively to yourself to act. So Joanna Messi's book, I can recommend you for dealing with despair. So if we live in that kind of way, I think children will grow in a good atmosphere. We have time for maybe one more question. I know you wanted to ask one. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kumar, next year the universities have a wonderful opportunity. The curriculum goes from three years yeah. to four years. Yes. So they get a lot more space to teach. Yeah. Um, we have the example of the International Baccalaureate where as part of the curriculum, students go out camping, an expedition, they have a hand skill, yeah. they do some community service. Yeah. Um, but we see in Hong Kong the universities are responding to this opportunity by lots of building more classrooms. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah. how, how can one influence them so that they make the education a bit more holistic with this extra year they've got, this wonderful opportunity? Yeah. No, it's a very good that uh, Hong Kong University is extending its three-year course into four-year course. That's good. Slow education. <laughs> like slow food, slow education. Very good. <laughs> Now, my suggestion would be that you use this time to develop, which I spoke in my talk, uh, develop other faculties of our being rather than just more intellectual work. Uh, intellectual work complemented with uh, physical and, and emotional intelligence and, and spiritual work. Education is also about transfer, transferring or uh, exchanging values. It's not just about ideas, it's also about values. And, and the, the parents and the elder teachers and the professors, they have inherited certain values which they have to communicate to the younger next generation. If we don't communicate values, if we just give them information, 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 knowledge, inter intellectual ideas, that's not enough. So I would say four-year course now you are starting, uh, that gives you a bit of time to, uh, to be a bit more inclusive rather than this exclusively intellectual academic excellence. Also have some other excellence. And excellence is the, the quality of learning is very important. So at this moment, universities are striving towards intellectual intelligence and intellectual um, excellence. I would like to make it a bit more bigger, uh, big and inclusive 
and include uh, transferring of values. What are the values? What is education for? Wh why we are in this world? What is, what is the meaning and purpose of our being here? How we relate to each other and the world around us? So that kind of um, deeper values, if you bring in education, then Hong Kong will be the leader in the educational world. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.